أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين وعلى صحبه أجمعين ومن التبع لسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأقول لكم يا أيها الإخوة والأخوات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم brothers and sisters I greet you with the greeting of Islam which is to say may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you after that, insha'Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his blessings and his peace upon his messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib al-Hashimi al-Qurayshi al-Arabi and upon his companions and upon his family and upon all those who follow and seek uh, assistance with his guidance until the Day of Judgment. Amabad, now as to what proceeds, insha'Allah, we continue uh, with our benefits. Normally on Saturdays, we do the Mukhtasar al Akhtariya Book of Fiqh. Uh, sometimes we do Mukhtar al Hadith al Nabawiya, the selections of the prophetic hadith in the Hukum al Muhammadiyya, in the Muhammadan wisdoms that is compiled by Sidi Ahmed al Hashimi. But today, inshallah, we have a special benefit uh, that is of a historical nature, although the effects of the benefit are still contemporary, and the legacy of the benefit uh, still, ex- uh, still exists to this day. Uh, specifically, we are going to discuss the group of people that are known as the Jahanke from West Africa. They are an ethnic group, or some call them a clan, or some call them professional professional caste uh, of scholars that are located within the larger Mandinka people of West Africa. And they become famous first in West Africa over the past... 500, 600 years because of the fact that they were people that were known to carry knowledge and transmit knowledge and people that whose dua was sought and people whose consultation was sought. But now with the modern era, uh, with different parts of the Islamic world becoming accustomed uh, to one another and becoming familiar with one another, the Jahaki curriculum and the Jahaki tradition is becoming of interest to laymen to scholars, and it has been an interest of, uh, of interest to Islamic scholars and Oriental scholars uh, alike. For example, within the Orientalist schools, we see that Ivor Wilkes, he dedicated a work to the Jahanke. Uh, we see uh, within the Muslims and the contemporary Muslims, we see someone like Mustafa Briggs. May Allah preserve him. He wrote a post on Instagram uh, clarifying the role of the Jahanke, uh, praising them. Uh, in conjunction with certain contemporary Jahanke teachers that are based in uh, in the West and that are actively teaching and propagating Islam. Uh, so there's a lot of interest regarding the Jahanke people. Uh, they do have quite a bit of benefit with respect to teaching Islam and spreading Islam. But very little is written about them uh, within the Western uh, scholastic uh, and academic landscape. When I say very little is written upon them or about them, I would say that the range of what's written on them is very limited, both in terms of depth and breadth. In terms of breadth, there might be 15 works total that focus on the Jahanke. In terms of depth, there's only one or two works that go deep into uh, the nature of the Jahanke. Some of these works have been criticized by the Jahanke themselves as being uh, inaccurate with respect to different elements of their society, different elements of their cultural practices, and different elements of their religious practices. Uh, if we're speaking from an academic perspective, it's often beneficial to state your position reflexively uh, and your positionality because of the fact that it allows the reader or the listener to gauge where is it that you are coming from and what is it about what you are saying that makes uh, it a value, first and foremost, and that could contain possible biases. Uh, the first thing to note is that I myself am a Jahanke from both sides, mother and father, but that also I studied with Jahanke scholars. And I didn't study for the purpose of necessarily obtaining a degree, but studying within the classical Islamic curricula, which is for the purpose of obtaining the benefit of knowledge that's going to be a spiritual salvation for you and a material salvation for you to benefit you in this life and to benefit you in the next life. So that is something that people should know and therefore it allows them to gauge the information that I'm saying both in terms of credibility and authenticity and to take what they can take and to benefit with what they can benefit from. 
Uh, so in this audio, we're going to talk about not only the Jahanke, but we're going to talk about uh, a particularly important figure known as Karamohoba or Karamba or Karamoba Tuba, who founded the city of uh, Tuba, Guinea in the early 1800s. But we'll get to his affair in a little bit. We want to set up historical context and have people understand what it is that the Jahanke represent and how is it that they came to be. How is it that they came to obtain this name and what are their particular features? So to understand the origins of the Jahanke historically, we have to begin in the Manding Empire. Uh, the Ghana Empire first and foremost, and then the Manding Empire. The Ghana Empire is the one that preceded the Manding Empire. Uh, its heyday is from uh, around the early 9th century to the early 11th century. and Contrary to what the name suggests, the Ghana Empire is actually located within uh, present-day Mali, present-day Burkina Faso, and parts of present-day Senegal. And it was founded by the group of people that are known as Suninke or Serahulle. They still exist to this very day, and some of them have a close relationship uh, culturally uh, religious and religiously with the Jaki up until this day. Uh, within the Ghana Empire, the rulers used to be known as Sise. As Sise, and this is going to be an important fact when we realize the founder of one of the, the founder of the Jahanke, as they are known today, he had uh, that name originally. So after the Ghana Empire uh, collapsed, it was the Mandane Empire under the leadership of the Sundia of the legendary emperor known as Sunjata Keita. Sunjata Keita, the name Keita coming from Sunjata Mansa Keita. It's as though he inherited the, the his children inherited the the the. The, the rulership, the word Keita, meaning to inherit something, Keita, to inherit something. So they call him Keita Mansaring. But it was under Sun, Sunjata Keita that the, that the Mali Empire began to form uh, from city to city, uh, from across Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Gambia, and into parts of Guinea. It was an extremely large empire. It was an empire that benefited from the fact that it was strategically situated. Uh, for one, even though it's in the Sahara, it has large, or it's near the Sahara, and large swaths of it are in the Sahara, it has large deposits of gold, uh, large deposits of salt, uh, and it had a thriving clo uh, cloth empire. So this made it some, a place that was, that, was, uh, that was extremely beneficial for the Muslim traders that were coming in, uh, for European traders that were interacting with those Muslim traders, uh, and for the wider world at large. Uh, we see, for example, the author of Maqamat al-Hariri, Imam uh, uh, Abu Qasim, uh, al-Basri, he writes that uh, he writes in one of his maqamah that takes place in Ghana, the furthest reaches of the Islamic empire. So the Ghana Mali was something that was known to the wider Muslim world. Uh, and the way things operated for the most part was that, you know, cities were largely independent but they would still pay uh, tribute and vassalage to a larger uh, imperial figure who was known as the Mansa, as the king or the ruler. Uh, and one of these cities we find is a city in the Masina region uh, which was known as Ja. The city was called Ja. Uh, and within the city, uh, like all Mandinkia cities at the time, when you hear the word Manding, there are some that are stipulated from the oral traditionalists that it comes from the word, um, it comes from the word, uh, it comes from the word uh, bading or family. That were all bading, bading kol, manding kol, family people, fam families were all related. You understand? Uh, but within that larger empire and that larger culture, you had a city that was known as Ja. This city is located near the Masina River on the Masina banks, and for whatever reason or for whatever reason or, or means, that city became known for Islamic scholarship. The people that were residing there, they had a lot of scholars. Uh, they had people that were particularly oriented towards Islam because Islam was nothing new to Northern Africa since the time of Uqbatu ibn Nafia. Uh, so within the city of Ja, uh, some say, some place the founding of it at around uh, 1000, some say 1050. But by 1050, 1100, it was already a, a thriving city. It was already a present city. Uh, within that city, there was born a man named uh, Al Haji Salim Suare. Uh, Al Haji Salim Suare, he died in the year 1250. 
he died in the year 1250 and he was born around 1080. He wasn't born uh, with the last name Suare. He was actually born as Al Haji Salim Sise. And as we said, the 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 during the Ghana Empire and uh, the early Mali Empire, Sise was just a titular uh, term that was attached to kings. So people could have the name Sise and not be related to one another whatsoever. And this was the case with Al Haji Salim Sise. Al Haji Salim Sise. Uh, because the Sises were the, the Qadis of the city of Jah, meaning that they were the caretakers of the city of Jah. Uh, so they had a, a kingly role at that time. They were, they were Mandinke. They didn't have this terminology. They were Jahanke at that time. They were just a group of Mandinke people that were living in the city of Jah. Al-Haji Salim Suwari was someone that was particularly particularly blessed. At the time he was still Al-Haji Salim Sise. Uh, he eventually would go on Hajj more than seven times. And uh, he would have a teacher that was, uh, some say that his teacher was Syrian, that he was Suhiyun. And he took the last name of his teacher or the nisbah of his teacher. And that's how the name Suwari came to be, that he was known as al Hadi Sise Suwari. Others, they say that the Suwari is uh, a terminology that refers to his horse. That in the Mandinka language, mm -hmm. uh, if you say Suwari Ware, it means a horse that has... Uh, different types of colors that its color is is different you know what I mean that it has uh, it's it's cloth that's on it is blue and red it's a colorful looking horse either in its skin or the color that that of the decor that is attached to the horse in terms of his bridle uh, and the saddle and things of that nature but in any case he came to take on the, the moniker of Suare and Al Haji Salim Suare within his uh, various hedge uh, he was someone that accumulated a lot of Islamic knowledge. Uh, he was someone that founded nearly seven mosques uh, across West Africa, the furthest of which was in Gambia. So he was someone that was traveling a lot. And the political landscape at that time allowed for travel because for the most part, the Munding Empire was secure. The Munding Empire was a secure place. Uh, you could travel from Gambia all the way to Jenne, uh, all the way to Timbuktu, and nothing would happen to you so long as you were under the protector of the empire. If someone were to do something to you, then they would necessarily have to face consequences, although it would be more difficult to rein in people back then than it is today, right? Because the technology for population control and those things didn't exist. But Haji Salim Swati, he was someone that came uh, to Africa and he was traveling different places for the purpose of garnering baraka and the purposes of building an Islamic legacy mm -hmm. and spreading Islam amongst what we call uh, ironically, Soninke, Soninke meaning the people that do not accept, the people that do not uh, accept the, the, the belief of Islam, which is why uh, the term Soninke from a Western application is kind of problematic because they call themselves Serahuli, they don't necessarily call themselves Soninke. Ala kulli hal, al Haji Salim Suare, when he settled in Africa, he came to the city of Jia, he had a mission that I'm someone that wants to uh, live an Islamic lifestyle, I want to find, I want to um, have a pristine society. Uh, of people that uh, that live cleanly, that follow the Quran, that follow the Sunnah, uh, that you know are you know living an Islamic lifestyle. Because the context back then was these are people that uh, are surrounded by pagans. You know, you're surrounded by people that still worship idols, people that sacrifice their children, people that engage in various forms of very dark magic, uh, and their way of life is unclean compared to the Muslims. And the Muslims that would convert, especially the rulers at that time, they would convert when they found being Muslim politically advantageous. And oftentimes their Islam would be a bit syncretic. Uh, you would see, for example, in the epic of Sujata Keita, even though it said that Sujata was a Muslim, uh, uh, many of the themes that are found there are, are of a pagan nature. M most of the themes that are found there are, are of a pagan nature. So al Haji Salim Suare, he and his, uh, and his students and his followers, they not only left the city of Jah, although they kept contact with it, they moved to the region of Bambuhu and they founded another city that was known as Bambuhu Jah. Bambuhu Jah in the Bambuhu region, which is a bit closer to uh, Senegal, but it's just another region of, of Mali. Uh, it's really Bambu and Jah. But two things occurred, and this was what led to the moniker of Jah Hanke being formed. The first was uh, 
that the Jahangi language, it's just a form of the Mandinka language. The Mandinka language has different dialects. You have Bambarang, you have Suso, you have Maninka, you have Kasongkang, uh, you have Konyakang. You have all these different types of Mandinka languages. It's like today, if we look at the Latin language, the Latin language was one language, but by the time it spread to the Portuguese, to the Spanish, to the French, to the Rom uh, Romanians, to the Italians, uh, it took a different character. But if you look at the root of the words and the way the words are, are sound, they're more or less mutually intelligible, right? But the accent between them varies, new words get introduced, and after some time, the degree to which certain, uh, to any two of them can understand each other, it changes. So a Portuguese person and an Italian person might be able to understand each other perfectly, whereas a Portuguese person and a Romanian person have a bit more difficulty, as an example. So within the Mandinka languages too, this is a case. Uh, the Jahangir the Jahangir language had a particular feature that they like to pronounce the word ha a lot. They like to produce. They like to pronounce the word ha. So whenever they would go places, people would tell them, would say to them, the men from Ja have come, or the people from Ja have come. So they would say the Jaanko, meaning the people from Ja, Jaanko, the people from Ja, right? And so they would call them. Uh, the the jahanke. So those are the two features: the ha that is natural in the accent of the jahanke, and then the fact that they traveled so much that and people recognize them for their Islamic uh, religiosity uh, is what made it so that they became known as the jahanke. You understand? They became known as the jahanke. So wherever they would go, people would allow them to come into the city uh, to conduct tafsir of the Quran, to give durus lessons. You know, because they saw the benefit of Islam, even if they were uh, newly Muslim, they saw the benefit of learning about Islam. And if they were non-Muslims, the Jahanke had such a uh in their affair that the pagans would generally allow them to settle on the outskirts of their of their regions, uh, and they would consult them uh, in legal matters and spiritual matters. Uh, because the one thing that you, if you look at history, is that pagan pagan uh, rulers, uh, whatever they find to be beneficial to them, they'll follow it, right? Uh, we don't even have to go to the Europeans where many of them converted to Christianity for that very reason. But we'll go to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu where some of his companions, uh, when they traveled, there was a group of people they traveled and they found a city uh, of the pagan Arabs and the Arabs, they refused to give them, um, uh, uh, they refused to lodge them as guests. So they sat on the outskirts of the village and eventually a, scorp a scorpion or a snake bit the chieftain of the village. And so when the people found that they had no hope of uh, of uh, recruiting the disease from their from their leader, they came to the group of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu that were on the outskirts and they said, they said that these people, they say that they have a scripture with them, so let's see if they have any type of ruqya. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi companions, he said, yes, we have a ruqya, but you'll have to pay us uh, this amount of, uh, of, of camels or cows for it. And they agreed. And then the companions, they went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they narrated what, the, what happened because some of them, they said, we're not going to take it until we're sure what the ruling of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is on this. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi approved of what they did and he told them to give them a share. Which goes to indicate to you that people, of the, that even though they're pagan and they're lost, the nur of Islam is something that they, that they recognize. Although the degree to which different factions of them accept it or fight against it, uh, it depends on the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Ala Kulihal, they moved to the Bambuhu region of, of Mali and they founded a city that was called Jahaba, the Ha coming from the accent of the Jahke once again, and it became known as Jahaba. And when in reality it's just Jaba, you know, they're just saying that we're founding a new Jah based off of our existing Jah. And when Al Haji Salam Swari, when he moved to uh, the city of Bamuku Jaha, there were a number of families that came with him. It's as though he said, Whoever amongst the Mandinke is oriented towards knowledge, whoever of the Mandinke is oriented towards Islam. Uh, and you have a clean approach to life, come with me, follow me, we'll found our own city, we'll marry amongst each other, and we'll ensure that, inshallah, our legacy is protected. And this is why the Jihad Kiri tend to be very endogonatic up until this very day. They marry amongst each other. You understand? And there were several families that were with him that formed the core of the, of the, of the movement. Uh, when they went, he had three cousins who all were coming from the same mother. Uh, one known as Fadiga, one known as uh, as uh, one known as Fofana, uh, and one known as uh, what's the third one? Excuse me, and one known as Drame. 
And so these four cousins, the fourth being al Hadis al Suare, they form the core of the Jahanke, along with the Jabi, the Kaba, the Jahite Kaba, and the Silla, the Silla Fava Khaira, and the Silla Jabi, different Sillas. And they came to Jah along with multiple other tribes, in the, and they came to Bambuhu along with multiple other tribes. They found people like the Dabo, they found the Sisaho, uh, uh, they, the Jikine were there. Uh, various groups of people came. It wasn't about the last name at that time. This was still when we were in the proto Jahanke era. You understand? And they came to Bambuhu, Jaha, and they settled there. Al Haji Salim Suwari would die uh, by the year 1253. Uh, excuse me, by the year 1278, I should say. He died in 653 Hijra. So that should be around um, 12, uh, 1278 Hijra. And in the city of Bambuhu, they had a very segmented way of doing things. Particular families were, were, were uh, responsible for the imamate. The Sillas were responsible for maintaining the imamet. Uh, the Kabaz were responsible for maintain, maintaining du'as and things that were done communally. The Jabis were, uh, were likewise in a similar position. They were the, what are known as the Kawandila, meaning the preachers, the people that would give speeches and bayans and khutbas uh, outside of obviously the Salat al Jum'ah. Mm. You understand? The Suarez were in the rule of the Qadi. They were the Qadis of the city. And then the various families would have different responsibilities, be they the Girasis, uh, the Fofana Girasis, the Dibasi, Fadiga. They all had their own responsibilities within the Jahangir cities. And what would happen is whenever they became too big, someone would leave that city and then he would go and found another city. Uh, and this occurred from the, 12, the late 1270s to the early 1500s. Uh, in the early 1500s, late 1400s, what occurred was that, you know, there was a bit of instability towards the transition uh, from the late period of the Mandinka Empire to the Songhai Empire. Uh, and when the Songhai Empire came about, it, it caused a lot, a lot of breakdown, a lot of breakdown uh, uh, from the time of Aska, Mu Aska Muhammad and Aska Musa and the likes of them. And so what occurred is that Jahanke, they en masse... Uh, in large groups, they left the Bambuhu area. Uh, they're still there to this day. Bambuhu Jaha is still there. Masina Jaha is still there. Uh, the Swari are still in Bambuhu Jaha. The Sisi are still the 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 the, the Qudat of uh, of the city of Jaha in Masina. But for the most part, they came to the Senegal Oriental region, the Oriental region of Senegal, the Eastern region of Senegal, that was known as Bundu. Uh, and it was in Bundu that you really see an explosion of, of, of what we call Jahankeya, the way of the Jahanke. Because Bundu was so spacious that they didn't have to live on top of one another. Each particular uh, last name uh, could build its own cities and they would still be close to each other. They would still marry amongst each other. Uh, and they would still have that same system that we're, we're the people from, from Jaha. So when they get to Bundu, uh, the Jabis, they found a city called Dide. Uh, the Sillas, they found the two cities called Misra and Bani Israel. Some say 800 years ago, but the more accurate figure is around 500 to 600 years ago. Uh, the Jerite, they found a city called Gunjur, and they found a city called Jailani. Uh, the Drame found the Gunjur, excuse me. Uh, the Jerite found the Jailani. Uh, the the, uh, the Jassis, they found a city called Suta. And amongst other cities, there was a, a lot of different cities that the Jahangir they founded in Bundu. And within Bundu, they were at the behest of the Fulani for the most part. So the Fulani, uh, particularly under the sea, uh, they tended to be people that combined not only knowledge, but they combined also military prowess. The Serahule, or what was called the Saninke as well, tended to combine military prowess and knowledge and wealth. Um, and this was something that allowed them to have somewhat of an advantage over the Jahangir, where the Jahangir were, were, were simply focused on one thing, which is the acquisition of knowledge. And from that acquisition of knowledge that, uh, the, and the proliferation of, of, uh, of Islam that would flow from it, which is one, and then also the necessity uh, of having peaceful conditions and being able to farm and having autonomy that were the conditions of being able to acquire that knowledge. And so the Jahanke were in this mode from the time of the 1300s uh, through the 1400s in Bambuhu and the 1500s in Bundu, they were upon the same thing. And in the 1600s, the same thing uh, with 
the 1600s, they had a bit more interaction with the, the society, with the Fulanis, some Jahaki figures such as Ture Fode, uh, they had alliances with uh, Al Haji Malik Maudosi, uh, whereas they helped them fight jihads, they helped them spread Islam. Uh, and so they had, there was a close interaction, there was a great bit of respect between them, and there was a respect towards the Jahaki because they did not bother people. You understand? It's not that they denied the legitimacy of fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, rather they understood that uh, much of what was declared to be fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be it in the Arab world or in the African world, was actually just worldly uh, worldly desires and misguided, misguided, um, misguided aims. It would be like someone today saying, why don't you go support ISIS? Well, why would I support a group of people that are killing people for no reason, mm-hmm. right? Or why don't you go support uh, Abdul Fattah Sisi, as an example? Why would I support someone that doesn't believe in Islam? <laughs> you know, just for the purpose of saying that, oh, he's a Muslim leader, no. So the Jahangir mm-hmm. had that insight of understanding that there are certain conflicts that are foolish and we're not gonna involve ourselves. And he had the insight to also know from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is that you attract more flies with honey than with feces. So what they would do is they would beautify their behavior. Uh, they had an aura of uh, of being aloof. When I say aloof, I mean politically aloof and socially aloof to not meddle unnecessarily in the affairs of people. Uh, and people will give you that respect so long as you don't meddle in their affairs because they'll understand that what you have is, is, is enough for you. And that they would behave in a very generous way with people. One of the prime traits of the Jahanke, uh, especially those from the Jabi guests of the clan, is that they're known for, for extreme generosity. They'll give almost anything that they have, and it's very difficult for them to, to say no when they're asked about something because that's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would never leave, he would never sleep even if there was a single dinar of gold inside of his house. He would find someone to give it away to. Even if it's a mountain full of camels, as we see in the hadith of the Bedouin, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would give it away. So the Jahangir were people that, in its essence, in such a distance away from the center of Islam, both in Africa and in uh, and in uh, in the wider Muslim world, from the Arabian Peninsula, they inoculated prophetic traits. They saw the they saw Islam, and they said, uh, and they said, "Sami'na wa ta'ana. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala put barakah in their affair. One of the later sheikhs of the of the Mauritanian sheikh Sidi Kabir, he said, "Ida jaal Allah barakah fi shayin qalil kathrahu, wa ida naza Allah barakah fi shayin kabir." Uh, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in something small, it increases it. And if he takes away barakah from something large, it just renders it as though it's nothing. And the Jahangir were people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ja'ala fi amrihim barakatan kathiran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a tremendous amount of barakah in their affair. And so despite being far and despite having a very, I wouldn't say a limited range, but a very particular range of education uh, at that time, you know, there was a focus on Quran and there was a focus on tafsir, uh, but there wasn't and a focus on basic hadith, but there was an extreme focus uh, in Bundu on different types of knowledge. You know, uh, it wasn't as 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 um, as wide of a breadth as it is today and as it would be later in Jahanki history. But despite that, the, what they knew within the religion of Islam, they practiced it uh, as best as they could. They practiced it as sincerely as they could. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in their affairs. There would be people whose dua would be uh, would be answered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would save them from the basic fit, the, the many fitting that would occur in the region. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased them. As it comes down to Surah Al Ibrahim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when Musa said to him, said to these people that Allah says that if you're grateful, I'll increase you. And if you're and if you're ungrateful, then my punishment is, is, is severe and painful. There are people that were grateful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased them. But in increase, Whenever increase occurs, uh, and whenever change has to occur, and, and, and expansion has to occur, oftentimes it comes after a period of turmoil. And this is what effectively occurred with the Jahanke, uh, in, in two stages. The first is the move from Bambu Jaha was somewhat traumatic, but they recovered. The second is that the breakdown of the Mandinke Empire and the uh, instability of the Songhai Empire in its later years, and the full Fulani Wars that would occur in the 17th century, it made it so that it would be very difficult for a person to, to just get up and, and go to Jenne or go to Timbuktu or go to these places to seek knowledge in droves. 
people would go one 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 one. There was still exchange, but it wasn't as fluid at, or as frequent as it was in the earlier in the earlier years of the of the Jahaki history. So by the early 1600s, what you would see is that they would be concentrated in their cities. They would travel around Bundu, getting knowledge from one another, uh, holding Quran Tafsir from one another, uh, and just benefiting in that way. But they would not expand much outside to gain the various Islamic sciences. Their wilaya was still there. They still had Baraka. Uh, they were still people that were known for uh, that were as bad people that worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala fervently. The people that you know, uh, if someone that their their elders hardly sleep out of simply worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the night time but the expansion of the knowledge was not as wide uh, so because of the, the fact that travel was, was fairly limited uh, and also the fitna of the wars that were occurring between various Fulani groups and various groups of the Sirkhule made it untenable to go back and forth to different places because you could be captured you could be sold as a slave and you just lose your life for no reason and this happened to many people uh, and it was in this context that we see uh, a very important figure uh, that we come to know now as Karamahoba or Karamba Tuba, meaning the great teacher of Tuba. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his hadith, he said at the head of every century, there's a mujaddid in my ummah, there's a renewer in my ummah. And what we see is the realities that occur uh, at a ummatic level, at the level of the ummah, they always have microcosmic versions. They have smaller versions of those things that, that occur, right? For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is the prophet of the entire, of the, of the, of the, of the alameen, you understand, of all of mankind. But before him, there was different prophets that would come. There were different prophets that would come to different people, right? We see, La'anatullahi alayhi, the Masih of Dajjal, he's going to come at the end of times. But before the Masih of Dajjal, there's going to be 30, uh, 30 Dajjalin. You understand? There's going to be three the jala. There's going to be three the jails that come before the end of time. So there's going to be different test runs, and different microscopic and microscopic elements that lead to the larger thing. And Karamba represents one of those uh, regional mujaddidin, one of those regional renewers. You understand? Meaning that the people in Pakistan had their renewers, the people uh, in Saudi Arabia had their re renewers, the people in Somalia had their renewers, and the people in West Africa had their renewers. And he would be known as Mudi ul Gharb, the illuminator of the West, meaning he's the person that illuminated the West in terms of knowledge, uh, the extreme West of, of, of Africa, by having so many tulab, by reinvigorating, uh, reinvigorating the region with knowledge and, um, and effectively expanding the scope of knowledge beyond what it had been. So Karamba was someone that was born in the city of Dide in Bundu, the same Bundu in Senegal Oriental that we talked about in the region of, um, in the year uh, 1733, uh, in the year 1733. Karamba was born some 500 years after al Hajj Salim Suare, maybe 400, 420 years, 430 years was between them, uh, but he was named after him by descent. His nisbah, his lineage, Karamba, his name originally was not Karamba. He was born as Alaji. Alaji. Alaji uh, Gassama, or Alaji Jabi Gassama. His father's name was Muhammad Fatima. Muhammad Fatima Gassama Jabi. Muhammad Fatima, the reason why he's called Muhammad Fatima is because Muhammad Fatima's father married the daughter of Alhaji Malik C. Maudo. Who was the Fulani leader of Bundu at that time, and her his daughter was named uh, uh, Fatima C, and Fatima C gave birth to Muhammad Fatima. Uh, Karamba's father was also Karamba's mother was also Fatima, but her name was Fatima Jahumba. Uh, her father was uh, Muhammad Fuli Muhammad Tanjigora Jahum, meaning Jahum was the last name, and the Tanjigora was also the last name. The Jahum being the last name of the women of that tribe. But they were of a Serhule origin. So this goes to show that at that time there was quite a bit of intermixing between the Fulani and the Jahangi and the and the Serhule because they recognized each other for their various virtues and values. Alakuli Hal Karamba's father's name is Muhammad Fatima. Muhammad Fatima's father was named Ture Fode. He's called Ture Fode because the person that he learned tafsir from, his last name was Ture. 
Today, Fodi's uh, father was named Fodi Abdullahi. It said that Fodi Abdullahi was one of those that uh, came from Bambahu and then he fought jihad with some of the Fulanis in order to spread Islam within um, within uh, Bundu. Others, they say that it's Tule Fodi that actually did that alongside with al Haji Malik Si. Ala Kulli Hal, Tule Fodi's father was named Fodi Alaji. Fodi Alaji's father was named Fodi Salim. Fodi Salim's father was named Fodi Amadou. Fodi Amadou's father was named Fodi Mustafa. Fodi Mustafa's uh, father was named Fodi Muhammad Sire. Fodi Muhammad Sire's father was named Fodi Bubakar. And Fodi Bubakar's father's name was Fodi Yusuf. Fodi Yusuf, Gassama. Uh, Fodi Bubakar's father was named as Fodi Yusuf. And Fodi Yusuf's father was, uh, excuse me, Fodi Yusuf's father was named as Muhammad Lamin. His name is Sambu Gassama. But Fodi Yusuf was one of the students of Al Hadi Salim Swale. So it was Karamba's 10th grandfather that was actually uh, in line with Al Hadi Salim Swale. Ala Kulihal, uh, Karamba was born as Fodi Alaji uh, in the region of Bundu Dide. His father, Muhammad Fatima, was someone that became known as Tafsir Mahdi because he had an expertise in, uh, in, in the exegesis of the Quran and doing Tafsir. Uh, and what we see is that in his education, uh, he learned from someone named uh, Umar Ture as well, he said, or Umar Sise, excuse me. And during uh, Muhammad Fatima's uh, education, for every juice that he completed, his wife, who was Fatima Tanjigora, who would be the, the Fatima Jahu, she would give gold and she would give cloth to Karamba's teachers. You understand to ensure that he's a fair. To, excuse me, to Muhammad Fatima's teachers, to ensure that he's a fair head barak, baraka. This is why uh, it's stressed uh, among the ulama of West Africa that whenever you're seeking knowledge, that you also make it go hand in hand with tabarruk. That your knowledge should have a form of baraka in it. It should be something that you know is blessed. Otherwise, knowledge without baraka it doesn't produce any results. Ala kulli hal. Once he finishes education. Muhammad Fatima, he left from his father's city of Safali. He, some say he founded Dide. Some say that his father left the city of Safali and founded Dide, Dide Gassama, the city of Dide that was for the Gassamas. But uh, Kulihal, he would be settled there and he would eventually pass away there and he would die there. Upon his death, Karamba was around 20 to 21 years old. Uh, he, had, he had finished the basic books of fiqh that were being studied in the majlis at that time. Like I said earlier, the majalis at that time of the Jahanke and in Bundu, they were not such that any one majlis combined every one of the funun, every one of the Islamic disciplines. Today, if you go to any Jahanke center, you can learn from aqida to hadith, to fiqh, to lugha, to nahu, to sarf, uh, to mantiq, to usul. You can learn anything and everything and not leave a, 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 a two mile radius. But at that time, it wasn't like that. At that time, every majlis or every city that had its own majlis, it was known for one or two things. This majlis might be known for tafsir. This majlis might be known for fiqh. This majlis might be known for hadith. This majlis might be known for usul. You know, so, and, those, and those were funun that were difficult to access anyways uh, beyond fiqh and tafsir. So the average person, when you finish the books of fiqh and you went to get, uh, do tafsir, what would happen is that you would, they would give you an amama, they would call you fode, uh, they would teach you different elements of the medicinal sciences and local knowledge that would allow you to, to, to benefit yourself, to be able to do ruqya. And then from that, from that point forward, you could teach what you know, be it in the ulum al or the ulum al batin. But Karamba, he had, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something for someone, he places a himma in him an ambition in him that will not be quenched within the particular location or the social station or the level that he's at. He's going to seek something that's higher than it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also provide the means for it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide the barakah for it. So Karamba, when his father died, he asked his, he consulted with his mother uh, and his mother informed him, he said, Karamba, Alaji at that time, he was still Alaji, he said that you are 
on the search for knowledge uh, and it, you said to me that it's time for you to go and do tafsir of the Quran because you finished all these books of fiqh your father is no longer alive uh, so if you want to be able to get tafsir you obviously have to leave the city and go somewhere else so he said to him she said to him she said that your father said that for you when it's time for you to do tafsir uh, you should hold the tafsir or you should take the tafsir because the ilm is to be taken from its people uh, it's only in today's generation because the nature of the of, of of knowledge today is such that it's widespread that you can go on Google, you can go on YouTube and just learn by yourself without ever having a teacher. That is possible. Your knowledge might not have the most barakah in it, but you'll still have the information. But in those days, even if your knowledge was little, it had barakah because you took it from its people and you had to go travel in search of it. Karamba's mother told him that your father informed me that you should seek tafsir from one of two people. It should be either Fodi Usman al Daring, who was in the Kunting, the city of Kunting in modern day Gambia, which is closer uh, to, to uh, Bundu than, uh, than it would seem. Uh, maybe it's uh, 300 and f 320 kilometers or so away from the city of Dide. Or you should go to Usman al Kansoko and the city of Jenne, which is Mali. So that would be maybe another, that would be 1200 to 1300 kilometers. So Karamba, he consulted his mother. He said to the mother, "What do you think? Where do you think I should go?" He said, "If it was for me, if it was up to me, I would go to Fure Usmana Daring, uh, because Usmana Daring was closer to Karamba than Usmana Kansoko." And so once that happened, he told uh, he told uh, he told Karamba's mother. Karamba told his mother, "Inshallah, mother, I'm going to work according to what you instructed me to do. I'm going to." work according to what you've instructed me to do, which is that I'm going to uh, attend uh, Kunting and I'm going to go study with Fure Usman al -Dari. And Fure, Fure Usman al he himself had a, a tremendous amount of barakah and ilm. Uh, he was someone that when it was time for him to finish his studies, Muhammad Fatima was the was a teacher of uh, Usman al He went all the way to the edge of Bundu Dide with Usman al and it was time to pray Salatul Asr or Salatul Bukhur. And when it was time to pray, uh, for Muhammad, Muhammad Fatima told him, he said, Usman, go ahead and, 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 and lead the prayer. He told him, go ahead and lead the prayer. Uh, and Usman Adarin being humble in front of his teacher, he said, uh, teacher, I've never led you in prayer and I can't do it, right? He said, have I, Muhammad Fatima told him, have I ever asked you to lead the prayer before this? He told him, no, you haven't. So he told him, go ahead and lead the prayer. So Usman al led the prayer and uh, he did what's known as intilaq. Intilaq means when your teacher says that you have effectively reached a stage to where you can teach yourself, you can go back to where you're from and you can begin to teach and whatever you teach, you can say that you learned it from me. Therefore, you have the sanad, the chain of transmission. So Karamba effectively left D-Day to go to Kunting to go and get the baraka of the knowledge that was uh, that was uh, that was contained by his his teacher, Usman al Daring, or to get the knowledge that was really his father's knowledge, but to just get the senate because it was with Usman al Daring. He went to Kunting. When he went to Kunting, he studied uh, he studied the Quran. Specifically, Tafsir al Jalalain. Tafsir al Jalalain is a tafsir of the two esteemed sheikhs, uh, Jalal al Din al Mahali and Jalal al Din al Suyuti. It's still widely read today. It's extremely beneficial because it's a text that it tells you what the alfad, the, the words of the Quran mean, and then it gives you the, the, the most readily understood explanation for a verse because the Quran is so deep that certain verses have a lot of explanations, but it tells you what the basic meaning of the, of the Quran is. And wherever it needs to have extrapolation, it allows you to have extrapolation. So we spent five years uh, doing this tafsir. And that's, that's something that's incredible because today, sometimes we finish this tafsir in one month out of a desire to rush through it. But he was there uh, seeking the barakah of his teacher by doing khidmah, by doing service to the teacher, and by taking the time to revise and revise and revise and revise. After five years, uh, and it was time for intilaq, for Karamba to leave, uh, Usman al that's when he gained his first moniker, which was uh, which was Fodi Alaji. 
he became known as Fode Alaji. When he garnered the name Fode Alaji, uh, this was because he became a Fode. He got the name uh, Fode Alaji due to having finished the Quran, having done tafsir of the Quran. His teacher called him and he said, I'm going to make dua for you for three things. And he asked the jama'ah to say Amin. He said that I'm going to make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you to search for that which you desire. The jama'ah said Amin. He said, I'm going to make it I'm going to make dua for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allows you to acquire what it is that you're looking for. He said the jama'ah said Amin, the jama'ah said Amin. He said, I'm going to make dua for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow what you seek to become lost. The jama'ah said Amin, he said Amin. So from there he left and he went towards Gunjur. Gunjur, he studied with Ibrahim al Jubate. He studied Nahu, he studied Sarf, and he studied various books. From there he left, he went to Jannah. Jannah, he met uh, a teacher by the name of Al Fanuh, excuse me, uh, yes, Al Fanuh, Al Fanuh Sise. Uh, he studied with Al Fanuh Sise, and with Al Fanuh Sise, he studied the Maqamat al Hariri. So, inshallah, we'll end the story of Karamba. Uh, for today uh, Because it's a long story And we want to make sure that we give it to, we give it to do So this will be part one Of the history of Jahankes And the history of Karamba And inshallah we will take it forward After this Jazakumullah khair Ya ikhwan We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and barakah Wa ma thalika Allah bi aziz Inna thalika Allah bi aziz Subhanahu rabbika rabbil aizad yamma yasifun Wa salamun ala al-mufsalim Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Allahumma salli ala muhammad